Good morning, good afternoon, and for those of you joining us long after your workday, good evening. My name is Patrick, and I will be your moderator for today's webcast titled Multi Antenna Error Measurements Using Digitizers, brought to you by Agilent Technologies. Our esteemed presenter today is Alexander Dixon. Alex is an application engineer working for Agilent Technologies in Loveland, USA. Uh, Alex joined Agilent in July of 2000 and has worked in a, in a variety of application engineering and marketing positions. His background in inf instrument augmentation and os oscilloscopes led to his most recent opportunity to work within Agilent's growing modular instrument division. We will begin today's webcast in just a moment, but first a little bit about the process. Alex will answer questions at the end of his presentations. To participate in the Q&A session, supply, uh, simply enter questions at any time in the Q&A window on the right bottom side of your screen. We do have a lot of people on the line today, so I apologize in advance if we don't get to all your questions during this session. But don't worry, if we run out of time, Alex will respond to the remaining questions through email. Also, within a couple of days, you will receive an email with a link to a copy of the slide set along with the recording of this event. And last but not least, we ask that you take a moment to fill out the short feedback form that will appear when you close the WebEx session after today's presentation. And now, um, let's go to the presentation. I'll, uh, I'll hand it up to Alex. Alex, welcome. The floor is all yours. Thank you, Patrick. So I'm going to go ahead and switch to our slide set that we'll be using today. And uh, just before we dive into the material, I'd like to briefly cover today's agenda. So what I will be covering in today's presentation is I will start with a, uh, an overview or a short history of phased array applications. These are specific, uh, specifically addressing antenna architectures and the enabling technologies and how we've uh, now found ourselves uh, at this point in technology with the active and passive electronically scanned arrays. Um, and then uh, I'll weave into that a bit of discussion about the test challenges uh, for these uh, phased array antennas. Um, the next section of material will cover the specific requirements of testing multi-element arrays, um, looking at phase and gain measurements, the complex signals uh, that will be produced by something like a digitizer-based system that will allow us to make uh, cross-channel ratios. Uh, between uh, two elements in the antenna to uh, analyze the magnitude and gain, uh, or phase and gain, I'm sorry, and then also uh, what kind of sensitivity is required uh, with a measurement system to achieve uh, the level of phase coherence uh, required for these measurements. And then also, finally, uh, some techniques for accelerating the measurements in terms of the types of test systems that would be advantageous uh, providing measurement acceleration. The next section will actually cover the uh, specific details of uh, designing a requirements definition for a test system, including the phase coherence digitizer feature set, and then also a little bit about also the signal chain in front of the digitizer for making measurements. Um, and we'll also cover what's required in terms of a overall system level approach to calibrating uh, one of these measurement systems. And finally, the last section where we'll spend a little bit of time is an actual demonstration of a realized solution. Uh, so we'll look at uh, Agilent's M9703A AXIE digitizer and uh, look at some of its uh, uh, contributing feature set that lends itself very nicely to this application space. Uh, and we'll give uh, a couple examples of making some real magnitude and phase measurements uh, with software available from Agilent Technologies. So I'll start with a overview. Uh, this is the timeline or history that I mentioned that I wanted to address initially. Um, starting on the left-hand column, you see in uh, the uh, 1940s, of course, the um, mechanically steered uh, antennas used for radar applications you know, that, that rotate, that have the parabolic dish with the feed horn that blocks part of the antenna aperture. So these are some of the early designs, uh, specifically in the area of radar. Uh, for, for antennas, and uh, as time progressed, um, the, the technology evolved, and uh, we 
started looking now to more of sort of planar arrays um, that are flat that don't require the uh, parabolic dish and also the removal of the feed horn uh, so we don't have the, uh, the, the uh, blocking or, or interference with covering part of the uh, aperture of the antenna. So mechanically steered arrays were uh, one step forward. Basically, they allowed for just one axis of rotation um, and uh, more of a, a sort of planar array in terms of the surface of the array. And then moving into passive and active electronically uh, scanned arrays uh, with the advent of phase shifters and then with the uh, ACEs or active electronically scanned arrays. Of course, the major technology uh, that came along uh, in recent history are the TR modules. And the TR modules incorporate both transmit and receiver uh, in the individual modules that are attached to the radiating elements very close to the uh, surface or the uh, base of the antenna. And that provides uh, a lot of flexibility in terms of being able to achieve uh, varying scan patterns and also multifunction use of, of different groupings of elements in the antenna. So in the uh, bottom row, I've just addressed some of the enabling technologies uh, for these types of antennas um, as, as time progressed and, as I mentioned, for today's modern arrays that primarily we'll be focusing on uh, for the application of the measurement system we're talking about, uh, it's the, the, two, the two technologies and the two antenna types in the, uh, the, the right-hand two columns. So the passive and active electronically scanned arrays uh, will be the multi-element antennas that will um, be addressable by the solution that we're going to discuss today. Um, so as I mentioned before, the progression into the modern active electronically scanned uh, phased arrays really was based on some key benefits that that uh, system could provide uh, for you for their implementations. Uh, one is, is that you remove some of the points of failure in terms of having a fixed position antenna. So no longer is the mechanical steering of the antenna required. And so that uh, definitely cut, cut down on the failures in terms of mechanical components in the antenna. And then, of course, the, uh, as I mentioned uh, briefly, the ability to form multiple agile beams. Um, so you can group different sets of elements, uh, radiant elements in the antenna together uh, to provide multifunction capabilities with these modern antennas. And because uh, also the, the scans, uh, when these antennas are used in terms of creating beams uh, that are scanning uh, the horizon, you can then uh, basically have a harder, pro harder predict or harder to intercept uh, scan pattern, which is good uh, for specifically for, uh, for instance, for radar applications. And then um, also the independent transmit receive modules per element. Uh, so we have the flexibility now with these modern antennas to be able to, to operate, as I mentioned, different grouping of elements separately for different functions. And uh, by having the transmit receive pair also uh, in each uh, connected in uh, the TR module to each element, we remove some of the power losses uh, then for distributing a signal out from uh, a high power signal out at RF or microwave frequencies out to the independent elements, um, which was one of the disadvantages to prior technology, uh, like the passive electronically scanned phased array, for example. And then uh, because you can rededicate the purpose of each element uh, based on having independent TR modules, uh, we have now graceful degradation in terms of uh, intelligent controllers for these antennas that allow us to rededicate the elements around single sources of failure if, for instance, one element were to fail in the antenna. So what I'm going to uh, briefly discuss now is uh, some, of, some of the test challenges you faced uh, with these antenna systems. And uh, this will lead into a discussion about what our, our test system can provide um, to, to be able to uh, adequately deal with the measurements required to minimize the errors associated with these uh, challenges. So to begin with, this is sort of a historical challenge. And it's talking about uh, beam patterns created like the one that you see a simple example in the bottom of this slide, uh, where you have in the um, center, of course, you have the main lobe. And then you have your side lobes in this radiating beam pattern. And if you uh, have uh, essentially phase and gain errors in the alignments between the elements in your antenna, that leads to larger than ideal side lobe levels. And so these side lobe levels um, are 
are wasted energy effectively uh, with a transmit beam pattern that looks like this with these side lobe levels. These, these, uh, the energy in the side lobes will be transmitted out into space uh, outside of the range of the target that you're, you're looking to focus the main lobe on. And then when the uh, signals reflect back, in the case of, for instance, a radar application, um, the energy will add in to the, uh, to the receiver and minimize your signal and noise ratio. So it's, uh, it's wasted energy in the transmit case, and it actually minimizes your signal noise ratio, uh, which is a disadvantage uh, in the receive scenario. So measuring, it's very important to be able to accurately uh, measure the relative phase and gain between elements in the antenna to minimize these side lobe levels. Now, looking forward into the future, another test challenge uh, that you've, you've all uh, mentioned to us in, in various conversations is that um, some of the uses of these antennas spans uh, signals that have modulated bandwidth as well. So in the future, it's not only uh, simple CW tones that are used with these antennas, you actually have signals that have modulated bandwidth. And therefore, a test system uh, is uh, one of the um, more recent requirements is a test system that can address not only the narrowband measurements for narrowband use scenarios of the antenna, but also deal with the wideband measurements. Um, so there's uh, a couple other uh, growing challenges mentioned on this slide. For instance, the array element counts also increasing. Um, so you're, you're basically getting more and more elements in the antenna to try to uh, basically uh, improve the resolution of the aperture. And then also, of course, the digital uh, moving closer to the, to the antenna. So in future uh, TR module implementations, we know that the digital buses will be the primary interface to the TR module uh, on the backside coming off the antenna. And so those, obviously being digital signals, those have uh, bandwidth as well. And so ideally for the future in terms of uh, setting up a measurement system uh, for these types of antennas, it would be a system that could provide uh, measurement capabilities spanning the entire use model, um, the expected use model for the antenna. So now what I'm going to talk to is specifically the um, testing uh, aspects of testing multi-element antenna uh, arrays. So there's primarily two approaches uh, when making measurements to, to try to align the elements in the antenna. One is the traditional narrowband approach, and uh, the other is the broadband approach, which is addressing more of the kind of modern challenges or, or uh, new challenges that I, I just uh, um, enumerated uh, a moment ago. So in the case of the narrowband approach, um, this is uh, the familiar approach. So in many cases, these types of uh, measurements have been addressed historically with the network analyzer. Uh, with the network analyzer, though, of course, one primary, uh, primary limitation is the analysis bandwidth. So you really have a fairly narrow band uh, measurement receiver in the case of the network analyzer. And so uh, that usually is involved using the sw uh, swept or step tone and measuring one frequency at a time. And cross-channel computations are performed in the time domain, uh, and you can reduce uh, the variance or improve the sensitivity of the measurement by integrating uh, for a longer period of time. So those are, um, those are all statements that apply to the network analyzer approach and, and fairly well known within this application space. Uh, but the broadband approach is something um, which is, is sort of new uh, and it um, really brings forth the advantage of using a digitizer in these applications uh, or a wider bandwidth vector signal analyzer uh, because they have uh, adjustable bandwidth. And so you can provide a broadband stimulus with a, a wideband receiver, and then by producing an FFT or spectrum measurement, you can measure all frequencies simultaneously and compute the cross-channel spectrums. And we'll talk a little bit later about how this actually works. Um, but essentially, you can achieve then the lower variance also equivalently by doing averaging across multiple FFTs. So one of the primary technologies, as I mentioned, that lends now a digitizer uh, to this application space of being able to address both narrowband and wideband scenarios is what's called a digital down converter, or DDC for short. And so a digital down converter is a digital signal processing block that's typically synthesized in an FPGA, for example, as in the case uh, of the digitizer we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, 
Um, it has a couple different uh, stages, uh, as you'll see in this diagram here. Uh, the first stage of the DDC uh, is, is typically called sort of the tune stage. What that provides is taking the real samples out of the analog to digital converter, uh, we can apply a numerically computed oscillator and compute a cosine and sine function uh, so that we can have an I and Q sample uh, created in the tune stage from the real sample produced by the analog to digital converter. And uh, because we can set programmatically this uh, sort of numeric uh, digital oscillator, uh, we can then change essentially the center frequency of where we tune the signal to. So for instance, as you'll see in a moment, if we had a signal, say, uh, at center frequency of 300 megahertz, we could apply a 300 megahertz LO uh, in this tune stage and tune our signal now down to baseband. So out of the tune stage, we would have a complex signal pair uh, of I and Q uh, at, at baseband. So that's the first stage of the DDC. The second stage is now that we've tuned our signal down to baseband, we can also apply a low pass filter and decimation stage uh, to reduce the bandwidth to the analysis bandwidth of interest. And that does a couple things for us, as we'll talk about here in, in one short moment, is that uh, we can reduce the sample rate going into memory, which makes it a more efficient mem uh, utilization of memory. And uh, also, we can remove integrated noise from the measurement. So looking at it in sort of a spectral view or frequency domain view, uh, this is how to uh, understand what the digital down converter does. Is so in particular, say, we were interested in analyzing this signal only. So the rest of the other uh, parts of the signal energy across the spectrum in the uh, bandwidth, wide bandwidth that's captured by the digitizer is sort of uninteresting to us in this, this particular measurement example. Um, so it will only add to the noise if we, if we keep that part of the spectral content around that's been digitized by the digitizer. Um, so the digital down converter allows us to focus in then on the signal of interest and reduce the bandwidth, uh, which improves our signal noise ratio, our effective number of bits, uh, just to the analysis bandwidth of interest. Um, and uh, then it also, of course, reduces the sample rate uh, so that we can more efficiently process the signal using post-processing algorithms, uh, like we'll talk about here in a moment. One example would be Agilent 89600 uh, VSA software, um, then, which uh, I'll give an example of in, in a second as well. So looking at a uh, simulator of the digital down converter, um, this is uh, a sort of tutorial about the steps and stages of the digital down converter we just looked at. So uh, what we have in our top view here is a signal that was uh, initially captured with the digitizer using real samples. And you see the complex conjugate symmetry of the real signal around DC. So DC is right here at the center where we get sort of discontinuity in our FFT. And then you see these um, two representations, positive and negative frequency of our, of our spectrum because this is a real sample signal. Now, if we go through the tune stage of the digital down converter, what you see is, is now our signal, uh, the, the positive frequency part is now centered uh, at baseband at DC. And uh, we've shifted um, all the frequencies by the 300 megahertz that we programmed uh, for our LO frequency of the DDC. Um, so nothing has changed in terms of improvement of resolution or sensitivity or reducing the bandwidth yet. Uh, this is just the first stage of the DDC producing the complex samples and shifting our signal down to baseband. Now the second stage of the DDC is where we get our improvement in sensitivity and the reduction of bandwidth. You'll notice that uh, what we've done is filtered out uh, all of the negative frequencies and the uh, parts of the spectrum that are of, not of interest to us. And we've essentially zoomed in on this sort of 100 megahertz span around our signal of interest uh, by introducing a decimation ratio of 8. Uh, what a decimation ratio of 8 means is it's a 2 to the 8 in terms of the steps going through the decimation filter that then brings us down essentially, uh, or I'm sorry, 2 to the 3rd gives you a value of 8. So it's three steps through the decimation filter that reduces your bandwidth uh, from plus or minus 800 megahertz down to plus or minus 100 megahertz. Now talking about uh, the, the other um, thing I mentioned briefly about the digital down converter is the 
uh, value of the tune stage providing us with I and Q samples. So with the I and Q samples, the reason why we can reduce the sample rate uh, is because of this sort of relationship between real signals and complex signals. Uh, as I mentioned before, with real signals, uh, by definition, you have to have the complex conjugate symmetry uh, of your spectral co content when you're computing FFT around DC, but then when you're uh, using complex signals, you only need a minimum sample rate uh, equivalent to the width of the span of the signal around, uh, around DC once you've tuned to baseband. And so complex signals provide us the ability to have asymmetry around DC and minimize um, our sample rate to the specific frequency, uh, frequency range uh, of interest. And looking at this from a real world example also, where we took a, uh, a digitizer and applied several steps of reduction of the, uh, of the, or a higher decimation ratio, effectively reducing the DDC bandwidth, um, you can see a plot here with various input power levels to the uh, digitizer. And so as you can see, uh, the legend here at the right, essentially these are in uh, DBM values uh, where the basically as the, um, the signal becomes smaller relative to the noise floor of the digitizer, you get, uh, you get more benefit actually out of each step of the DDC. So with each reduction of DDC bandwidth, proportionally you get a larger reduction in the relative phase variance of a cross-channel measurement which tells you you get more improvements actually as you are using the smaller uh, amount of the input uh, uh, dynamic range of the digitizer, which is valuable in some of these applications because uh, typically off of an antenna, for example, when you're making a measurement, you might not have um, the full one volt full scale signal coming into the digitizer. You may be challenged in terms of having a fairly low amplitude signal once you've done the necessary signal conditioning and uh, distributing that signal off of, off of the antenna to the digitizer. Um, the uh, polar plot at the bottom here, bottom right of the slide, depicts the idea that what we're doing by reducing the DDC bandwidth is effectively reducing the noise uh, on each one of these samples. So the red and green vectors here represent two different channels of measurement from a digitizer, and the, the, the round circle at the end of each one of these vectors is the uncertainty created by noise. And so as we reduce the integrated noise and measurement, the radius of those circles becomes smaller, and therefore the uncertainty in terms of the phase position uh, relatively between these two vectors becomes less, and therefore that's the improvement or reduction in your relative phase variance of the measurement. You can also think about uh, the improvements in terms of resolution, of, for instance, on phase measurements in the time domain. So looking at this depiction in the slide here, what you'll notice is, is that I've actually digitized the signal with using uh, several different decimation ratios of the digital down converter. And you can see as the decimation ratio goes up, or equivalently our bandwidth goes down, the actual amount of noise you can see uh, traveling along or uh, sort of modulating this, uh, this uh, sinusoidal signal becomes smaller. So our peak-to-peak uh, jitter and noise on the signal is less, and therefore our ability when we draw a threshold in the time domain through the signal at a particular voltage level, uh, we can better determine the crossings or intersections of our signal to this threshold to allow us to then make, uh, for instance, phase measurements. Um, so this is a depiction of how you would actually define a phase measurement in the time domain, and you can see with a reduced noise uh, as obtained by a, using a, d a digital down converter that you'd be able to then calculate that phase more accurately. Um, what I've got here is a couple slides that address some of the math then uh, by, by which you can use the uh, cross-channel samples uh, coming out of the digital down converter for uh, calculating relative uh, phase and magnitude. So uh, what this slide covers at a high level is just that you can think about this uh, X and R arrays here as these are arrays of complex samples uh, from two channels of a digitizer. And so you have the two arrays of your complex samples, and what we want to do is we want to form a cross-channel ratio. And so G1 uh, in this notation would be our cross-channel ratio, and it's a, it's a ratio formed by taking the ratio of these uh, two arrays, and then you're basically multiplying the numerator and denominator by the complex conjugate 
uh, of the denominator to sort of normalize uh, the denominator. It creates uh, basically multiplying the, the uh, complex number by its conjugate gives you a real number now in the denominator uh, for G1 in, in terms of your, your samples. So now that we have G1, what we can do is very readily with um, using complex notation be able to calculate what our relative channel, channel phase, and magnitude are. And so that's the idea. The further uh, explanation about this G1 as far as a summation uh, form is just if you wanted to use multiple adjacent samples uh, to be able to compute G1, that could give you some additional advantages by essentially performing averaging across multiple uh, oversampled values uh, from the digitizer. But that's optional, of course. Uh, in this case, the notation uh, n could be simply equal to uh, 1, and then you would just have the same notation as we look at above. And once you have G1, uh, then it's a simple matter of, uh, of math here in terms of um, the magnitude squared power and then the, uh, the arctangent uh, of the imaginary over the real to calculate the phase on that G1 ratio. So this, again, is all uh, fairly, I think, well understood. Uh, it's the same technique used to, to calculate these ratios uh, and, and uh, magnitude phase measurements in the narrowband scenario as used with network analyzers. But going forward, the uh, new test challenges uh, in terms of modulated bandwidth signals can be addressed using the frequency domain approach or wideband approach. And that's what I'm going to cover in the next couple slides here. Um, so Typically, when you're thinking about a wideband stimulus signal, then uh, you would have a signal that has, you know, obviously some uh, some bandwidth. Uh, in in many cases, this signal, uh, as far as what we we've, we've performed tests with in in the lab, is uh, using something like a chirp, for instance, that uh, has a sort of flat uh, response across a range of frequency. And uh, the depiction here, in terms of the block diagram, with H of F and then the additive noise you can think about this as just simply a transfer function. So we're, we're looking at this as sort of a high level of a stimulus response measurement. But in the case of a uh, active uh, antenna measurement, um, this would be essentially the transfer function and additive noise between two elements in your antenna. And so that's what this is representing in, in this particular application scenario. Uh, you have an input spectrum, S of X, and you have an output spectrum, S of Y, which is essentially the input spectrum multiplied by the transfer function plus the additive noise. Um, so thinking about how you would then uh, approximate or evaluate the transfer function, uh, the conclusion that's uh, most simply reached is, well, divide the output spectrum by the input spectrum. And that's almost true. The only thing to keep in mind is that depending on the windowing technique and also because of the additive noise, your input spectrum is not always uh, uniform. So by simply dividing by the input spectrum, you can get uh, essentially at specific frequencies a very bad estimate then of your transfer function. Um, so the better approach is using uh, the auto spectrum technique where essentially what we're doing is we're performing a multiplication uh, and, and sort of normalizing by the input spectrum's complex conjugate, similarly to what we did in the narrowband case and then using that as a ratio, these two values, to compute an estimate of our transfer function. Um, so that will give us a better estimate. And this is a, uh, uh, an implementation detail as used in some already uh, software that's out there today, like Agilent's 89600 VSA software, uh, when you're using what's called FRF, or frequency response functions, um, you, you will be uh, employing these same types of calculations uh, behind the scenes in that measurement package. So there's a, there's a bunch of words on this slide, but what I want to summarize is, is that there are benefits and trade-offs uh, with both approaches, both narrowband and wideband approaches to these measurements. Uh, narrowband is familiar, uh, but it does require a little bit tighter control in terms of the timing of the measurements, and uh, you're only getting a single magnitude and phase point at a time uh, from the individual discrete frequencies. Um, but the wideband approach can be almost anything. It doesn't have to be uh, as uh, as much uh, of a, a specific, you know, just CW tone signal, as long as you're creating modulated uh, energy across the frequency range of interest and applying that equally then to two, uh, two channels, you can make the measurements uh, to, um, to determine cross-channel magnitude and phase at multiple frequencies uh, using the, uh, the cross-spectrum technique. 
And of course, this allows us to use then wideband signals that more closely mimic uh, real D uh, DUT signals uh, that may be uh, more appropriate given a particular test scenario. So now I'm going to spend a little bit of time in terms of discussing the configuration of an actual test system and what's required. So looking at a sort of high-level block diagram of a test system laid out to make measurements across multiple elements in an antenna, um, what you see here is that in this block diagram you have some signal conditioning elements. Uh, just depending on the power levels coming off of the antenna, you may in some scenarios have some signal conditioning initially in terms of a attenuation or gain stage, and then followed by doing the um, sort of mixer-based uh, or analog down conversion to take the signals uh, from their RF or microwave frequencies uh, down to a frequency that will fit within the 3 dB bandwidth of the digitizer. And then following that, you also typically have uh, some further signal conditioning in terms of amplification or attenuation as well as uh, some filtering uh, like a anti-alias or low-pass filter um, that will remove some of the higher energy outside of the bandwidth of the digitizer. And so that's kind of a simple block diagram of the layout. And some of these uh, different blocks uh, can vary in terms of specifically uh, what hardware is used just depending on the specific antenna architecture and the types of signals that uh, that, that, um, that you might be testing with those antennas. So uh, Agilent has a, a broad breadth also then of application engineering expertise uh, in this measurement space. And so if you get into setting up one of these systems, obviously we'd be more than happy to help you identify the right hardware. So um, I'm going to cover uh, not uh, specifically addressing any uh, specific module or, or hardware here. I'm just using this one as an example initially and talking about the requirements specifically of the digitizer in the system. So a uh, feature list, I would think, would be appropriate uh, as you're building out um, sort of a wish list for the pieces and parts uh, of a measurement system for this application would be a multi-channel digitizer um, that has a, um, a large number of phase coherent inputs uh, if, you, if you want to accelerate measurements and make mo many measurements of, of multiple elements in parallel. Um, so it allows you to then uh, be able to, to take these measurements in parallel if you have a digitizer that can provide that. Uh, and of course, as I mentioned before, uh, in terms of the block diagram, is you'd want a digitizer that then can receive the um, a signal with the span or bandwidth uh, of the signals of, uh, that you'll be testing your antenna with. And so that can range, of course, from you know, very narrow band up to tens or hundreds of megahertz. Um, and so you'd want to have a, a digitizer that can address those different uh, scenarios that, that will mimic real-world signals you'd be using with your antenna. And then um, a big advantage uh, to be able to allow a digitizer-based system to be able to achieve the sensitivity at the different uh, bandwidths is a digital down converter. So you'd want to find, uh, obviously, a, a digitizer that can allow you to achieve very good sensitivity uh, for the different ranges of bandwidth being used. And, and the digital down converter really is the the tool that allow you to do that. And uh, phase coherent inputs, so in many cases, uh, obviously, the digitizer needs to achieve uh, a lower phase um, variance between the channels than, than what you'd expect in terms of measuring the phase variance of your antenna. So um, if you don't have that, obviously, then the error contribution of the digitizer would be more than uh, your, your sort of measurement margin, and uh, you would not be able to get you know, accurate measurements. So that's a very important characteristic of a digitizer that you select. And then ideally also, if it's a scalable platform, as the antenna element uh, count grows into the future, um, you can then add more, for instance, digitizers to be able to make more measurements in parallel. So that would be a uh, sort of value add uh, for having a scalable platform. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about the RF signal chain in front of the digitizer as well and what would be required uh, to consider the, the sort of measurement accuracy uh, or sensitivity that can be achieved with a measurement system using given components uh, in front of the digitizer. And so what's really important to understand is the contribution of this signal chain as far as noise figure and gain goes uh, to the signal passing from the antenna into the digitizer. And so if you have characterized these individual elements in the signal chain, um, you can calculate the cascaded noise figure using the Friese equation, 
and then knowing that will help you understand what the signal noise ratio is and absolute power at the input ports to the digitizer. And we'll talk about applying uh, some math to then calculate what would be the expected variance given a certain signal, uh, signal chain in front of the digitizer in a moment. So um, what Agilent did to make sure that we could characterize and have confidence in our digitizer platform in terms of the channel-to-channel -channel phase coherence um, is we, we applied a couple different methods to making measurements of the digitizer. One was the sign fit method, and the other was using a, uh, a basically a perfect sort of software digital down converter um, to be able to create complex samples and then make the uh, complex ratio measurements using the algorithms we talked about earlier. Um, sign fit method is just a, a different approach where essentially you're capturing samples and then you're creating a, uh, a mathematical sign fit to those samples uh, of a single tone. And then, of course, since it's a mathematical sign fit, you have infinite resolution on determining um, the actual crossing points on a threshold uh, to be able to compute the uh, phase between two channels. Um, they both have their, their trade-offs, but they both, when used properly, can produce uh, pretty accurate measurement results for analyzing the coherence of a digitizer system. And so what you see here from the table is that we have pretty good agreement between the two methods. Uh, the plot shows um, the, the dotted lines are using the VDC method and the sort of solid lines are using the sign fit method. But what this tells you is, is across various input power levels to the uh, digitizer, we can achieve very low um, phase variance or equivalent skew variance if you're talking in units of time. And so these numbers uh, from powers of 10 to minus 24, for instance, if you were to take the square root of that, remember the variance is sort of standard deviation squared. If you take the square root of that, you'd be down into the uh, picosecond range, um, which is uh, very low in terms of the amount of then uh, the variance between channels. Uh, and we have a couple different because there's eight channels in this particular digitizer, we have a couple samplings of cross-channel sets just to see if there's any you know, better or worse performance between certain pairs of channels. And there's a little bit of variation, but overall we can still achieve very low uh, variance across channels in, in the case of this particular digitizer. So that would be a type of measurement you would want to use in terms of qualifying a digitizer uh, for achieving uh, phase coherence for your measurements. Um, then another thing I promised to mention here was a, uh, just a summary of what would be required then for calibrating a measurement system using a digitizer and a signal chain in front of it for, for measurements with these uh, multi-element antennas. So the system level calibration is really dependent upon um, sort of certain constraints you have in terms of measurement requirements. Uh, you know, how are you using the system? What, is your, what are your frequencies in terms of bandwidth and center frequency? Uh, what modes of the digitizer are using and how accurate is good enough. And these will all, questions to these answers will help you decide of how sophisticated the system level calibration needs to be to achieve the uh, sort of resolution or sensitivity of the measurement that you need. Um, but once you determine that and you have uh, a, a known set of information about the signal path in terms of like S parameters, for example, um, the typical way of calibrating one of these systems would be using a, a source that has wide bandwidth content, so it could be a step generator, comb generator, um, but it's calibrated and you know the corresponding relationship of, of different harmonics or different energy in, across the spectrum of that source, and uh, then you put it into the, uh, in parallel, into input channels of the digitizer, and then by taking samples with the digitizer uh, and knowing what the signal is from the source, because it was characterized, it's been calibrated, and then looking at the samples in the digitizer, what we can do is, uh, using the S parameters, we can deconvolve the response then of the signal path. And so this is kind of talking about at a high level, um, but these techniques have, have uh, been used before. Um, it's similar to uh, how you'd be calibrating other sorts of RF uh, vector signal analyzer implementations, for example. And then the one challenge that's left is uh, using this technique is you're calibrating out to a reference plane in front of the splitter in, in terms of making these measurements. And so the question may come up, well, how do I remove the contribution of the splitter and the cabling? And um, one approach to that is, is since we have a, um, a multi-channel measurement system here, you can basically do uh, what we refer to as sort of two-step differential cal. Uh, 
where you can uh, reverse the orientation of channel pairs and then sort of average out uh, the contribution then of the splitter by, by calculating a correction um, based on the average of the measurements uh, between uh, one orientation and then the opposite ori orientation of those channel pairs. So it's a little bit more than what I can easily depict in a single slide, but again, we can help you with implement, uh, implementation details if you go down the path of, of uh, designing a system like this um, using our, our, our hardware uh, from Agilent Technologies. Um, and then it also depends when you create the correction factors or the calibration data, um, it, it's a little bit uh, is dependent upon how you want the output of that calibration to be formed uh, based on what type of software you're using for your analysis. In this case, I'm using a depiction here of a, um, a correction table um, or an IF calibration file in, in the terminology of the software package from our 89600 VSA software. So once you know the magnitude and phase response across frequencies of your, of your digitizer system, for example, and this is just a very um, sort of generic example here, not, not depicting any uh, specific digitizer's performance, uh, you, you then can create um, a transfer function that will flatten the magnitude and linearize the phase. And then from that table, you can load it into, for instance, the um, IF calibration file in 89600 VSA um, to, to calibrate the system. Okay, so um, that concludes that particular section of talking at a high level of what it requires to configure a test system. And now I'm going to progress into a discussion briefly of a real measurement system. Um, so I'll move through this uh, fairly quickly in the next few minutes I have left here. So Agilent has a, um, an AXIE modular instrument system uh, that we can uh, utilize for these uh, measurements with multi-antennas and it's based on the M9703A digitizer. This digitizer is a high-resolution 12-bit digitizer with eight phase coherent channels um, with sample rates up to 1.6 giga samples per second. Um, it's actually a fixed sample rate unless you have the digital down converter option, uh, which can allow you then, of course, to, to manipulate the sampling rate uh, based on the analysis bandwidth. Um, we have the digital down converter option as an add-on option, and uh, also we have support for this uh, controlling this digitizer directly from our 89600 VSA software. Um, so if you have the M9703A and you buy the DDC option, um, you, if you already have the 89600 VSA software in your lab, you can then for free control this digitizer uh, from that software, which uh, it will use the DDC in the background and then um, give you a very fast measurement uh, performance uh, because it gets the data decimation from the hardware DDC. And we support this in a wide range of operating systems and programming automation environments. Um, so pretty much uh, we try to cover all bases in that case uh, so that uh, it, it can be integrated into your, your measurement system. And as I mentioned, we have the digital down converter option. Uh, the digital down converter is synthesized into our Vertex 6 FPGAs on this digitizer. And it provides you um, flexible programmable bandwidth uh, or decimated sample rate starting out at um, the, the non-DDC mode, of course, of the digitizer without using DDC is 1.6 giga samples. And then programmatically, we can go from 400 mega samples down in powers of two uh, to, to various uh, lower uh, ranges of, of bandwidth uh, with the DDC, improving at each one of these steps, improving the sensitivity of the measurement. Um, the row here in red is uh, red specifically because at this uh, particular setting of the DDC, it's a little bit of a special mode um, that does not produce fully image protected samples. So that's just one thing to keep in mind. If you're using the 89600 VSA software, we start out at a maximum of 200 mega samples per second because it only utilizes the fully image protected modes of the DDC. But this is still available to you from the programming API. Uh, another feature that the M9703A has, uh, which lends itself valuably to, in some cases, measurements with antennas, is what's called segmented memory mode. And segmented memory mode allows you then basically to subdivide the acquisition memory of the digitizer into discrete segments um, that allows you, if you, for instance, have uh, different modes of operation that you're testing with the antenna, you can capture a signal for a certain period or a fixed duration and um, then just keep your, uh, your, your time counter running 
um, and not be capturing actual samples, not to waste the memory of the digitizer. And then when the next event occurs, as depicted sort of in this time domain view, maybe we have all this idle time where we don't want to be capturing samples down here, but the second event comes around and that gives us our second trigger event. Uh, we'll capture then samples around that second event. And we can fill up our memory uh, ba basically looking at it as a cyclical buffer. We can fill it up as these individual segments all having the same, uh, same length um, and uh, that will achieve then uh, better utilization overall of the digitizer's memory. So that uh, we, if we are careful about this, we can use this to synchronize to, for instance, a test plan that maybe you have uh, switching between different modes of the antenna during these sort of dead times in between segments. So I'm going to cover now in the next couple minutes a, a demo setup that we've used to actually make measurements with the M9703 a based system. We used also another Agilent um, AXIE module in these tests um, called the M8190A, which is our arbitrary waveform generator, wideband arbitrary waveform generator in AXIE. And then what we did is we attached that through a splitter into the eight input channels of the digitizer. And then we're pulling out data either using 89600 VSA software or other custom software on a PC controller over PCI Express to compute uh, our FRF or frequency response functions at multiple frequencies. And so this is using a 100 megahertz wide LFM chirp uh, in, in the wideband measurement scenario. So this is the actual hardware setup as it sits on my bench here in Loveland, Colorado. Um, the middle module is the 89, or I'm sorry, M8190A arbitrary waveform generator. And the top module here is the M9703A digitizer. And so that's basically the path is our output signal from the AWG goes through the splitter into the input channels then of the digitizer. And this is a screenshot then taken from Agilent's 89600 VSA software controlling the digitizer. And what you can see is in the um, left column we have individual channel spectrum and time domain view of what's coming in on channel one. And then in the right column, these are cross-spectrum measurements. So between channel two and one, for instance, we could pick any channel pair we want. We just happen to pick the, the first two channels of the digitizer. We have the uh, magnitude and phase FRF functions calculated. And if we dropped on a marker on these views here uh, from uh, within the VSA software, we can then compute a magnitude and phase at any one of these frequencies across the modulated span of the uh, LFM chirp. So anywhere in that 100 megahertz span, we can compute magnitude phase uh, between the channels coming into the digitizer. And because we're also employing, uh, in behind the scenes, we're employing the hardware DDC, we can achieve a very fast averaging rate uh, using this technique of 250, approximately 250 averages per second, uh, which if, in, if we use averaging in this measurement scenario, the benefit is, is the uncorrelated part of the signal continues to drop in terms of uh, dropping towards uh, the noise, uh, absolute minimum noise floor or thermal noise outside of the modulated bandwidth. So we improve the sensitivity for each additive average we do of the spectrums here in the VSA software. Um, another thing that I wanted to highlight though is that we do also have a example software uh, utilizing uh, MATLAB. So MathWorks MATLAB, I actually worked with um, some of the engineers at the MathWorks to, to implement this measurement example. And this will use the same measurement algorithms we addressed earlier in terms of cross-channel ratios to be able to compute both the narrowband and wideband scenarios uh, for, for making cross-channel measurements. And so this is a software where we can freely provide you the source code uh, so you can dig into the algorithms and see how they actually work uh, in a real piece of, of software. Where of course with the 89600 VSA software, uh, it's a commercial package, and, and obviously we, we don't give away the source for that. Uh, but for this, you can you can open it up and understand how it works uh, if you're trying to automate some measurements uh, like this for your antenna. Um, the last couple slides I'm going to cover here before we jump to the question and answer session is uh, we've we've done some performance benchmarking with this system in house, and this is just a couple example scenarios. Uh, covering some narrowband and wideband measurement cases. And really, I don't want to concentrate on covering every little fine detail of this, but the idea is, is that we can achieve a very fast uh, measurement throughput uh, 
uh, with using this system. So if we take the aggregate eight channels on a single module of the M9703, each channel we're able, to, in this particular scenario, to measure, for example, 152,000 um, intervals per second per channel, and multiplying that by eight across the eight channels gives us a, a total aggregate measurement throughput of 1.2 million measurements per second. Um, so the way we come about that, just so you know, is that we're using segmented memory, and we're going to then measure across 100 measurement intervals. So um, basically uh, what we're doing then is, is taking a measurement across these 100 intervals with a rearm between segments then of the digitizer uh, of 160 microseconds. And this rearm time is dependent upon the DDC decimation ratio that you have programmed in. So it does vary a little bit in terms of you can see between like 160 microseconds and 40 microseconds at these different decimation ratios of the DDC. And then we're keeping a fixed um, sort of DUT time or uh, dependent time switching modes in your, in your, in your DUT, um, which is also in parallel to um, then the rearm time in the case of the, uh, in the digitizer. And so if the digitizer rearm time is longer, uh, as in this scenario, that will be a sort of limitation or that will be the limiting factor, whereas in the other two scenarios, um, the, the, the DUT switching time is sort of our limiting factor. And then we also have um, basically the acquisition cycle time, which is the accumulation uh, of the, the longest either uh, which is ever is longer rearm time or DUT time. And then that gives us then, if we go through the math, we can compute what our time per interval is uh, based on making 100 intervals, uh, 500 microseconds per interval, and then with the 660 microseconds of additive uh, time per interval, we come up with then our per interval time and then if you take the inverse of that, that gives you your actual intervals per second per channel. So don't get too hung up on all the math here. The idea is, is that to prove we can make very fast measurements with the system. And then, of course, this scenario is uh, looking at a wideband case where we're doing less measurement intervals, but we're able to compute multiple magnitude and phase measurements uh, between each, in, in each interval that we uh, compute. And therefore, our measurements per second go down, but we're getting more useful information out of each measurement. And finally, the last couple slides are just going to talk a little bit about the math in terms of how good is a measurement. We've, we've addressed now that the measurement is fast, but from this system, how good is it? And um, again, I think what I want to do with these couple slides is you can always go back and uh, review this at a later time in terms of uh, the recorded seminar in terms of uh, going through and computing an example scenario on your own. But the idea is if you make the assumption that noise is complex and noise, you can look at it as power, um, you can relate then the noise power to signal noise ratio, and then by assuming that the, um, the noise, uh, part only half of the noise contributes to the angle variance, uh, you can divide by two, and then this uh, factor out here is your conversion from radians to degrees. And so going through the math and the assumptions that are, that are laid out in this slide, you arrive at a cross-channel angle variance computation that allows you, because the, uh, the noise is uncorrelated between two channels, you can add those together. This would be equivalently basically channel one and channel two. So we can add those together and then keep our same uh, factor for changing from radians to degrees out here in front. And that will give us this, this, uh, this algorithm to use, if you will, to compute what our cross-channel expected angle variance would be using this system. And so using an actual example scenario then with the M9703, uh, we computed that the noise figure of this uh, digitizer is about 30 dB. And so plugging into the algorithm we just developed, um, knowing what our input power levels are at the two input ports uh, from, from the DUT, stimulus and response, we're just referring to them as here, we can compute then an expected angle variance of 6.5 milldegrees squared in this scenario, or equivalently, a standard deviation of 0 0.08 degrees. When we made the actual measurement of real hardware, we ended up with a standard deviation of about 0.1 degrees. So pretty good correlation between the actual hardware and the expected uh, angle variance as computed by these uh, algorithms. So this is just uh, here for you. If you get into building out a test system based on the M9703, you can come back and refer to this calculation to determine you know, in terms of that signal chain we talked about earlier and its contribution in terms of noise figure and gain, what the overall impact would be in terms of the sensitivity that you'll be able to expect from the measurement system. 
So finally, the summary conclusion is the Agilent M97038 digitizer with our digital down converter option provides a multi-channel phase coherent measurement solution with a fast adjustable bandwidth measurements um, that uh, really optimizes the amount of, uh, of duration of the capture or uh, minimizes the amount of data that's required for doing post-processing uh, analysis. And with our integrated 89600 VSA control of this digitizer, um, you can bring to bear the wealth of existing industry standardized measurements um, using that platform. And so for further information, you can jump to this uh, link at any time, and we've got uh, uh, quite a bit of marketing collateral there for you to peruse if you'd like uh, for antenna measurements. And so with that, I'll go ahead and see if we have any questions that I'm able to address. Patrick? Uh, thank you, uh, Alex. Uh, before we start with the Q&A session, I would like to remind everyone about uh, our sh short feedback survey that will pop up uh, after you uh, uh, exit the WebEx session. Uh, it will only take a few minutes of your time, and, and we really would appreciate uh, all your feedback. Now on to the Q&A uh, session. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, please just enter them in the Q&A uh, window on the right bottom side of your screen. Uh, we'll try to answer all of your questions during the session, but uh, we will come back uh, th uh, through email if, if we haven't been able to. So, uh, Alex, here's the, here's the first question. Um, when controlling the M97038 digitizer directly from the 89600 VSA software, is the software using the digital down converter option inside the digitizer's FPGAs? Yes, very good question. So um, there's a couple uh, pieces to the answer to that. So first of all, uh, with today's implementation, the, um, the DDC option is required with the M9703A to be able to control it from the 89600 VSA software. So keep that in mind is that uh, it's, it's a requirement to have the DDC option in the first place. But furthermore, um, the 89600 then, depending on the span you choose um, within the, uh, the software, it will actually then programmatically control the DDC and set it to the appropriate span so that you get just enough sample rate uh, for the analysis bandwidth of interest and then therefore improve the sort of uh, cycle time or speed of uh, repeated measurements within the VSA. So you get a much more responsive uh, VSA environment uh, when it's using the digital down converter at the supported spans that we, uh, we addressed earlier in the slide. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, how does using a digital down converter option compare to using an analog mixer-based down converter? Okay, so uh, it is a, an interesting question because I, I do get this one sometimes in regards to uh, a little bit of a misunderstanding about what is a digital down converter, um, but uh, what I'll explain is is that the, the digital down converter, again, is a, a DSP block that gets synthesized in the FPGA, and it's only able to make computations on samples uh, taken from the analog to digital converter. So obviously, uh, whatever the Nyquist bandwidth is of the uh, front end of the, of the uh, digitizer, including the analog digital converter, is the limitation of uh, what we can work with with the DDC. Now, the analog mixer-based uh, down converters are also typically used in this uh, in this application scenario uh, with multi-element antennas because you have antennas dealing with RF or microwave signals um, that need to be first mixed down to an IF that fits within the bandwidth of the, of the analog bandwidth of the digitizer. So usually they're used in conjunction. They're both used, uh, but the the analog-based uh, down converters uh, can handle uh, bandwidths or, or frequencies much much higher than what we can address typically with the uh, DDC. And of course the DDC, another part of that I guess I should mention is the DDC is uh, the, other, uh, the other advantage is it produces better sensitivity by giving you the uh, decimation of the data and the uh, increase in signal noise ratio and effective number of bits that we talked about. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Alex, um, we still have a couple of questions that um, uh, coming in through the Q&A, but I'm afraid we have only time left for, for one final question. Uh, all the other questions will, will get answered um, through email, as mentioned before. So uh, final question for you, Alex. Um, 
When calibrating a phased array with this method, can we also perform measurements in the transit mode? Can we observe the transmitted signal with the digitizer? Okay, so this is, a, this is an interesting question. We may need to uh, look at uh, particularly the, the measurement scenario to understand the block diagram that I'm being asked for, but what I, what I think is being said is, uh, you know, you're, you're wanting to make measurements on a um, transmitter as well as receiver scenario with the phased array antenna. And so what I would say is, is that uh, this, because this digitizer has up to 800 megahertz of bandwidth, uh, it just depends on the, the connection or basically the signal layout of how we, we deliver the signal from the antenna down into the uh, digitizer. So that's probably the most complicated part, uh, but, the, but the digitizer has uh, these phase coherent multiple channels that can be utilized uh, with a, they have to be all the same span, but they can be, uh, they can be at different center frequencies as well with our DDC implementation. So I believe the answer is yes, but I'd want to qualify that with a little bit deeper look at the actual uh, architecture that um, is being conceived here. Um, so feel free, if you're the one that asked that question, to get in touch with us. Um, I can actually uh, briefly put something here on the screen also so that if anyone has further questions or would like to get, for example, the MATLAB uh, demonstration software I talked about earlier, uh, feel free to contact me also directly. So here's my uh, email for any of you that might want it. Okay. Yes. Thanks, um, Alex. So um, we're, we're we're about to close um, our session today. We're r right on time. Um, as Alex mentioned, um, yeah, don't uh, please get in contact with us if in case you have any uh, any questions coming in. Uh, still, uh, open questions we will answer through email. Uh, thanks again, Alex, for this great presentation today, and thanks to everybody uh, for attending today's webcast called uh, Multi-Antenna Array Measurements Using Digitizers, brought to you by Agilent Technologies. If you are interested in other Agilent webcasts, please visit uh, www.agilent.com slash find slash events um, for more information. Um, my name is Patrick. Thank you for joining us today, and uh, have a great continuation of your day.